I think it's clear that the ECP played a pivotal role during the global financial crisis, during the euro crisis that followed, and in trying to straighten out the European banking system. I think it's fair to say that the ECB and the euro are here to stay, but that doesn't mean that the ECB is without enormous challenges, not the least of which is, to quote the summary of its last policy meeting, a protracted slowdown in the euro area economy, persistent downside risks, and an inflation outlook that continue to fall short of its aim of close to but below 2%. So Philip Lane's job is to fix all that. Um, Since June, he's been a member of the ECB's six-member executive board and as chief economist, which is always an important role at the ECB. That's the person who presents the monetary policy options to the full committee. It's perhaps more important now with the appointment of Christine Lagarde, a lawyer by training, as the ECB's next president. Uh, Mr. Lane was, from 2015 to 2019, governor of the Bank of Ireland and thus a member of the ECB Governing Council, its equivalent of the FOMC, and that followed a distinguished career as an academic, much of it at Trinity College Dublin. We're very pleased to welcome him to the Hutchins Center and to Brookings. He's going to speak. He has some slides. There are people watching online, so don't fall asleep. And afterwards, I'll come up and ask him some questions and then invite some questions from you. So with that, Philip Lane. Good morning, uh, and thank you for the invitation uh, to speak here this morning. So uh, I think my my plan is, in in these opening remarks, is really to provide you with a compressed uh, overview of the situation in Europe and the monetary policy situation, and explain to you uh, why we made the decisions we made at our last monetary policy meeting. And then after that, I think it's probably more productive to see what what questions you have. so my, my focus is really going to be on, on the conjunctural near-term situation. The, uh, as David noted, uh, we've had a, you know, a lot this year of a 20-year retrospective of the longer uh, perspective on the ECB in the euro area, and I'm also happy to talk about that in the Q&A. But here, as I say, I'm more focused on uh, the monetary policy issue. And essentially, uh, of course, when we talk about monetary policy, especially when the, our mandate is basically price stability, uh, the first chart to show is, well, what's happening with inflation. And what this graph shows you is the blue line is headline inflation and the yellow line is, is core. And essentially, the grand narrative of the ECB is in the first 10 years, uh, headline inflation averaged pretty close to the target. It hovered around one92 so if you like, uh, if you go back to 10-year assessments of the ECB, there was a high degree of satisfaction that the inflation objectives were satisfied. Uh, and of course, it wouldn't be too surprising during the crisis, or in, especially in the second uh, double dip uh, sovereign crisis in Europe, that there was some uh, downward drift in inflation. But in, in 2014, uh, especially, there was gathering concern that there was uh, essentially momentum driving inflation maybe uh, towards zero or even negative. So the big uh, shift in the ECB was in 2014, where the assessment was that uh, the risk of deflation, the risk of too low inflation meant that uh, the ECB had to adopt uh, the phrase of non-conventional monetary policies. And essentially, uh, I joined, as David said, the Governing Council in 2015, maybe a year and a half after this uh, intellectual decision was made. And through 2015, through 2018, I think there's a high degree of uh, uh, satisfaction that essentially the strategy was working. Uh, Given the severity of the negative shocks and so on, uh, there was definitely a patient outlook that only over time would we return to the inflation target. But the momentum was there. We, were, uh, we had uh, inflation move away from the zero deflation area, moving up and uh, to around 1%, and with enough momentum that our forward projections uh, had inflation returning close to, close to the target. Uh, so there's a high degree of satisfaction that uh, the decision to adopt more accommodative monetary policies from 2014 onwards uh, 
did map into more stimulus, uh, lower financial conditions, uh, more rapid recovery in, in Europe. So, for example, unemployment, which was double digit, is now around 7.5. And this big recovery in the European economy, uh, of course, there's other drivers, but in part could be attributed to the decision to make monetary policy more accommodative. And uh, what's happened essentially this year is uh, there's been a reassessment of the outlook, uh, both for output and inflation. And in response to that reassessment, uh, we decided we needed to do um, uh, a recalibration of the monetary strategy to really reinforce the accommodation. So if you like, um, it's usually we talk about the forecast uh, which is a point estimate, but it's important also to think about risk management. And what this graph shows you is what the uh, options markets are telling us about what investors believe might be the future for inflation. And the, the bottom color, I'm not very good with colors, so I'm going to call that uh, orange, um, is you can see the, uh, the, bo the bottom uh, uh, color is the probability mass on deflation. And in uh, 2015, that was spiking upwards 2014, 2015, spiking upwards to around 30%. So investors put a significant weight that uh, Europe would go into a deflation environment. Uh, that was then essentially more or less eliminated by the monetary policy of the ECB. So until quite recently, the deflation risk uh, had basically been eliminated. Uh, now, towards the end of the graph, you can see that it's climbed up a little bit. But the bigger story is the gigantic mass, which is in the below 1.5 territory. So in other words, I think the, the, the investor assessment is, uh, we think you're going to avoid deflation. We're not so confident you're going to get inflation close to but below 2%. And in that scenario, again, uh, it's important to take that seriously because we know everywhere, uh, if in inflation expectations get de-anchored, if inflation expectations go too low, then there's a, a momentum in inflation which is undesirable. Um, now, let me talk about the macro situation. And what we have is a very unusual situation. Is uh, The blue bar shows you, if you like, the quite strong performance in uh, 2017, essentially. End of 2016 uh, through 2017, the European economy was growing very well. So if you like, uh, there was an assessment that maybe uh, there's you know, unusual temporary factors. So the fact that in 2018, the economy began to slow down initially, uh, you could point, well, maybe this is partly just uh, returning to potential growth rate. Maybe we can point to some one-off factors. And there were some one-off factors like weather shocks, um, uh, some regulatory changes in the car industry and so on. Uh, but ba basically what's happened is uh, it looks like that slowdown is more persistent uh, than might have been assessed a year ago. And when you have a persistent slowdown, given the lead time in monetary policy, uh, then essentially the assessment is, look, uh, this is not, we can't just wait and see. We've got this persistent slowdown. Uh, we, need, we need to take that into account. But what's interesting about the slowdown is it's very sector specific. And I know it's very similar in other parts of the world, including the US, uh, which is essentially a dramatic reversal in, in manufacturing, in industry. But basically, the services sector remaining quite resilient. That is uh, quite unusual. Historically, the correlation between manufacturing and services is really high. So if the shock driving the economy is a macro shock, like, say, financial conditions or other some other shock, which is basically pervasive across the economy, these sectors will move together. What we have right now is a shock that looks like it's disproportionately in the manufacturing sector. Now, there's obvious factors behind that. We know there's a slowdown in world trade, which is mostly in manufacturing, and we know uh, there, there are trade disputes in the world, which basically are about manufacturing goods and agriculture. Uh, so we have this asymmetry. Um, and so, for example, another way to look at it is the correlations between manufacturing and services. And what this shows you is typically the correlations are really high, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 
they basically have come down a lot. And all of this is just saying we've got a big slowdown in manufacturing and services so far uh, remain quite resilient. Uh, and uh, you can see this also in the asymmetry in the leading indic indicators such as uh, PMIs, uh, huge reversal in manufacturing, some slowdown in services, but more or less remaining in, in positive territory. So uh, we, th we think this is an interesting situation. It helps to explain why a, a big, because every day you're going to read a newspaper or look online and see some negative news about manufacturing. And the, with the temptation to extrapolate from manufacturing to GDP is many times maybe a good idea. But when you think about what's going on now, it's not necessarily going to be a good guide to overall GDP. Um, and so when you have a pretty strong services sector, uh, pretty strong consumption still in the economy, uh, what we're seeing is also going to come back to inflation, is the labor market remains quite strong and actually in an increasing way. So what this graph shows you, we've inverted unemployment to make it more easy to read. We've got this big improvement in unemployment from uh, above 12 to mid sevens. And for a couple of years, when we saw unemployment falling, we didn't see wage inflation. Because essentially, going from very weak to weak labor market doesn't create too much wage pressure. But going from uh, into a strong labor market that's when you begin to see wage pressure. So what we see now is significant wage increases in the euro area, uh, in line with, if you like, versions of the Phil wage Phillips curve, which basically say when the labor market is hot enough, you do see that. So the transmission mechanism from a slack to wages is there. What we're seeing right now is uh, basically a lot of the wage the increase in labor costs being absorbed in lower profit margins. And that's one of the big you know, debates about how much of that uh, is sustainable. I know there's a similar debate here in the US, but maybe the economics of uh, profit margins in the US and Europe are quite different, uh, given the different uh, uh, evolutions of profits. So if you like, there is a momentum in inflation. There is a momentum in the economy uh, excluding manufacturing. Uh, and so this is why, even though uh, inflation is essentially, core inflation is kind of moving sideways around one, it remains the case we have uh, a projection where inflation is going to climb over the next two years. So the yellow line is the current forecast, which says inflation is going to climb from, around, you know, core from around 1 to 1.5 over the next two years. And this is why it remains the case uh, that our, our outlook remains... Uh, less optimistic than before, but still a reasonably positive picture. Uh, we're not, we, we are seeing a slowdown, but it's not macro pervasive. Uh, we are seeing this momentum in the labor market. Uh, so we do think uh, the case is there. And these are, you know, if you like, uh, uh, we try and have robust forecasts. So these are not kind of on the edge of forecasting models. They're more or less in the middle of a different range of forecasts. Uh, so we do see a uh, climb in inflation but importantly, compared to, say, December 2018, it's going to take longer. And, you know, the two years ahead forecast is uh, now 1.5, when it was 1.8 from the point of view of last year. So, again, this explains why we want to move. Uh, and then maybe the last piece of data that's interesting to think about is what's been going on in the uh, bond market. And this year has been very interesting, uh, both in the U.S. and in Europe. So clearly, part of this is a global factor where there's been a big uh, movement in, in the 10 years. And it's, it's very interesting to think about, well, why is that? One version is just the, uh, the world's in the investor community believes uh, the world's not going to grow very quickly. And also the world's investor community is, uh, puts some degree of pessimism about the uh, delivery of the inflation targets of central banks, uh, including especially the ECB. So we've seen this big uh, downward drift in the 10-year, and essentially, uh, you know, to the extent it's signaling uh, a risk of de-anchoring of inflation expectations, it's signaling uh, a probability that demand will be weak in the world economy. Again, uh, that reading would reinforce the case for action. 
So we, we acted. We acted uh, in a package type way because, of course, when uh, you have already fairly accommodative monetary policies, uh, you do have to think about uh, making sure that the, the, the monetary space you have is efficiently managed. So the deposit facility rate, our key policy rate, uh, we moved down from minus 0.4 to minus 0.5. Uh, we restarted net purchases at 20 billion a month. Uh, we, uh, uh, we have this targeted lending program, Teltro 3, which we extended maturity and made the financing cheaper. And to uh, provide some relief to the banks holding excess liquidity, we exempted some of their excess liquidity from the negative rate. Um, and then, very importantly, so those are kind of actions we took but we also gave more detailed forward guidance about, well, what are our future actions going to look like? And essentially, uh, this is the most concrete version of forward guidance uh, that we have provided compared to the past, which is essentially saying, uh, we want to see inflation uh, uh, converge uh, to, to our targets, uh, both in terms of the forecasts, but also in terms of actual inflation being close enough that the remaining gap between actual and projected is not too, not too distant, so people can be confident that these low rates will remain in place until inflation is really uh, can come back. Very importantly, this is state contingent. We're not saying this is a calendar, because the world is quite uncertain. So uh, some people choose to focus on downside scenarios, but let me point out there are also upside scenarios in the world, especially given when you have some of the reasons for the slowdown are political. Uh, discussions about the future of uh, European relations between the UK and the EU27, uh, globally in terms of the various trade disputes and so on. Uh, so those can be resolved in more favorable or less favorable ways. And this forward guidance is uh, an automatic adjuster. If there's good news, the uh, rate, the date of liftoff will move forward. If there's bad news, the, rate of, the expected rate of liftoff will move uh, backwards. And then uh, let me say that this is not, this is a highly considered decision. We now have five years of data on these unconventional policies. And by the way, this year, when you had that really big move in the bond market, that was a very interesting piece of data and saying, well, what's going on this year? And so we are confident that these policies are helpful. We have a wide range. It's been a very creative and stimulating time for monetary economists. So, so the people uh, are very good staff, do all sorts of different studies uh, uh, to try and work out what's uh, the contribution. And if I focus on 2018, the most recent year in this study, uh, we're saying overall, if we think about it in terms of, um, say, the 10-year rate, we think these policies mean that 10-year rates are about 1.2, 1.3 percentage points lower than otherwise. And that's quite a lot of stimulus. That's quite a lot of stimulus. And we think a, a, a large fraction of that is our asset purchase program. Um, but also we think that um, it's been very helpful that the negative interest rates, uh, so there's a, a contribution from negative uh, short-term rates, and also from the forward guidance. Uh, so let me emphasize, for example, uh, the, the fact that the interest rate, the pass rate is negative with the forward guidance means we have this very interesting uh, pathway, expected pathway for future interest rates. So the market believes that um, as of now, the deposit rate is minus 0 0.5. They believe that if conditions get worse, we may go more negative. So the, the, if you like, there's this belly effect in, in the uh, curve. They, they think a, a few months from now, maybe interest rates will go more negative, and then they will start to, rec to move uh, less negative over time. And uh, this is not saying we're going to do this, but the fact that the market believes we have the option to go more negative does mean that financing conditions uh, are cheaper than otherwise. Um, uh, we, we think the asset purchase program uh, ha, I say has a, a big effect, especially at longer maturities. So when we look at the effect, when we buy bonds, how the yield curve responds, 
uh, we have this effect across the yield curve, but it's most powerfully at the longer end. Let me, uh, the economics of negative interest rates, which I know the US has not yet uh, entered into that, that world. Uh, but it's, it's quite interesting because if you split up the area between the stronger and weaker economies, uh, you, you have seen in the stronger economies, banks, at least with their corporate depositors, being willing to charge these corporate depositors negative rates. So now in, the, in these countries, you know, a significant fraction of deposits is being charged with negative rates. So in other words, the banks are able to pass on the negative uh, rates to depositors, at least in the non-financial corporates. And what's very interesting, and there's this uh, a fantastic study using our bank level data by a group of uh, internal and external authors, the Alta Villa et al. paper, which you can, uh, is in our uh, published series, and what this shows is, if you look at country at banks which have been brave enough to pass along negative rates and those that have not, uh, in fact, those that have passed along the negative rates have been doing fine. They've been able to grow loans. They're, they're not losing depositors in any significant way. And this study tries to do all the causality and uh, controlling for it, sample selection and all of that that you can find. So I think there's a lot of evidence when you start looking for it that the negative rates are, uh, have been effective. We absolutely, uh, I accept every single side effect people list, but you have to quantify all of those side effects against the fact that it does provide stimulus. Um, and so uh, in the end, the core issue for us and for anyone trying to track, you know, are we hitting the reversal rate is, uh, are, are these uh, wholesale market conditions being passed along into lending rates to firms and households, yes, they are. Uh, what you see here on the right, and even throughout 2019, so this is up-to-date evidence, we are seeing uh, the lending rates for non-financial corporates and for households coming down this year. So in terms of the transmission mechanism about making financing conditions for the real economy easier, it remains quite effective. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll skip over it, but basically we also think the, the uh, targeted lending program is also helpful. And uh, finally, in terms of the interesting mechanics of excess liquidity, which, by the way, uh, because we're now restarting the net purchase, is going to go up now. So the black line is telling you the, the stock of excess liquidity. Uh, and what we've done now is we're saying uh, we're exempting a fraction of that. We have to set the exemption level as to avoid uh, having the interbank market get de-anchored from our deposit rate. And what the right graph shows you is basically uh, where, where the excess liquidity is does mean uh, that there's not going to be any deviation from, from the floor. Uh, but that, that's, it does provide a significant relief for those banks with uh, a lot of excess liquidity. And then maybe in terms of uh, what we care about in the end is, is this helpful for inflation? And, output. and again, this is a kind of a robust aggregation of a lot of different ways of trying to calculate it. We, we do think uh, all of these programs put together have had a significant uh, contribution to the recovery in European GDP. And uh, the counterfactual where we hadn't done this, the inflation performance would have been significantly worse. So again, uh, we can all uh, uh, lament the, the world we're in, in terms of uh, uh, super low interest rates, all of that. But, the, but we do think, given the world we're in, the policy response we, we, we've taken has been helpful. And maybe let me stop there to allow time for Q&A. Is we think uh, our assessment is this slowdown uh, can't be attributed just to one-off factors. There is a persistent slowdown. Uh, that, uh, as night follows day, has led to a delay and a partial reversal in the inflation pathway. So we have to take action. Uh, we're, we think our monetary policy is effective. And so we do, you know, we're not kind of, it's just not crossing your finger. We have the evidence that our monetary policy has been effective. Uh, with the forward guidance, it's basically saying, look, we're not just telling you what we're doing today. We're telling you what the future pathway is going to be, depending on the state of the world. And maybe the last point uh, is essentially we're also saying, uh, by the way, under these scenarios, with a slowdown, 
and with a pretty horizontal profile for interest rates, fiscal multipliers for those countries of fiscal space uh, will be significant. And if governments uh, which had that fiscal space did uh, engage in counter-cyclical fiscal policy, it, it does mean our monetary policy would be uh, more effective because the uh, level of demand in the economy would improve. So with that, uh, let me stop and uh, we'll see what questions you have. Uh, well, thank you very much for that uh, comprehensive and lucid presentation. I felt particularly honored to be watching you put slides up, all of which say ECB confidential on the top right corner. So okay. uh, <laughs> um, made me feel very special. Uh, did make me worry a little bit about the security of your information at the ECB, but we won't, we won't dwell on that. Um, I wonder, because it's so timely, if we could talk for a minute about Brexit. Uh, as you know, we seem to be taking this, or not we, uh, the British and the Europeans seem to be taking this down to the wire, and maybe today we'll know whether there's a, a, a deal to uh, separate the UK from the European Union. Uh, as I understand it, your forecast assumes a deal. So a couple questions. Is getting a deal going to make a difference to the European Union, to the Euro Eurozone economy? Is there going to be some, you know, everybody will feel better because there's a deal? Is it inconsequential? And uh, I'm sure you've spent the last three years thinking about what happens if there is no deal. If we don't have a deal on October 31st, does that change your outlook at all? So um, I didn't mention it in the presentation, but throughout this year, we've been, uh, the way we handled wait and see in March was, we have this forecast and we have clear downside risk that is not in the forecast. But when you, you have a, a kind of a weakening forecast, and you add in downside risk. Again, uh, that's that's essentially why we're highly vigilant in terms of monitoring the economy. So, what what do you do when you have this uncertainty about Brexit? So, the decision was uh, the baseline is there's going to be a deal, because that's what essentially what everyone was trying to find was find a deal. Uh, and so, in the scenario where there were no deal. Um, then that'd be a realization of the downside risk and we'd have to adjust our forecast. Let me emphasize, uh, so the deal itself, uh, of course, if there is a deal, uh, there's no doubt about the ranking. Uh, a deal is better than no deal. Uh, that's a very deep insight, isn't it? So the, <laughs> uh, a deal is better than no deal. So in that sense, uh, it'd be good to avoid the downside risk. But it'd be very important, and I, you know, when I was governor of Central Bank of Ireland, I'd have always been, a, I made a lot of speeches about Brexit, is even a deal is you know, a, inferior for economics to the UK never having entertained the option to leave the EU. A deal will still be quite disruptive in terms of the future labor market for the, Euro, for the EU, where the mobility of people between uh, UK and the EU27 has, I think, you know, been a very important part of the, I think, I mean, if you know Europe, you know the amount of uh, mobility for many people between the UK and the rest of the European economy. Uh, uh, so I think that's, that's uh, for, typically when we talk about uh, trade and so on, it's trade in goods. Services, when the, when the, unless it's perfect regulatory alignment, which is not part of, the, I think, the discussion, the, the kind of nature of services trade in Europe, which is extensive, uh, will, will be fractured. So even, uh, so the kind of uh, outlook for, for everyone is that a deal is very welcome, but it's in no way diminishing the fact that uh, a, a, a Europe where the UK is outside the EU is, is uh, not, not the first best from the economic point of view. Uh, I imagine if there's a deal, there's a transition period so there isn't also even uh, these negative effects will be delayed for a while. Um, but compared to many investors have been waiting. So now there is, if there is a deal, the clarity for that will mean uh, compared to the uh, worst scenarios, uh, the, the elimination of that uncertainty uh, will, will lead to you know, s some uh, good news, I'm sure, for the UK economy and your area. Um, 
let me emphasize, though, there isn't asymmetry. The UK is, I think, about 14% of EU GDP. So even really bad outcomes for the UK, for the euro area, mechanically, uh, it's, it's negative, but it's, you know, it's not, this, you know, it doesn't pass through one for one. You know, shocks to the UK do not pass through one for one to the euro area. Um, unless uh, there was a kind of a contagion effect where there's some kind of a negativity in the UK financial system led to more risk uh, aversion in the European financial system. But the mechanics of that, it's not super clear. That's super likely at the moment. So um, when you look at why Europe has slowed, one of the common explanations, you mentioned it and others have, have harped on it, is, oh, there's all this trade uncertainty. There's a, a slowdown in global trade. It's all Donald Trump's fault. Um, and if only that would go away, we could go back to the way things used to be. Um, but in many respects, uh, some people in Europe think of Europe as if it's a small open economy. And for a long time, Europe has benefited from the very huge appetite that China has had for European exports. As the uh, Chinese economy slows, not only because of the trade war, it seems to me that Europe has to rethink its business model. And it's not quite clear to me that the European economic leaders have figured out what that means. Uh, how do you think about this? So uh, I would uh, generally agree that regardless of the trade war, which has been very unfortunate, uh, and let me generalize it, absolutely for China, but more broadly, uh, as emerging markets' income levels go up, you know, the mechanics of convergence mean they're going to grow more slowly. On top of that, uh, as you know, there's this middle-income trap hypothesis where maybe it, it's turning out in some countries where they level off is le a lower level of income than might have been expected. So there's, a, I think, a general sense that the um, uh, prospect, you know, the engine, which has been so important, especially during the crisis and afterwards, the engine of the world economy has been uh, China and more broadly the emerging world. Uh, if that engine is weaker, uh, then uh, those who've profited from exporting uh, to those countries need to have a rethink. And let me emphasize, when you look at the forecasts, we all know in the, it's in the IMF this week, there's a slowdown in world GDP. The slowdown in world trade is more intense than that, and the slowdown in uh, euro area exports is more intense again. So there's a pivot because what's happening is the composition of world GDP is changing as well, which is fairly obvious that China's uh, much more focused now on uh, domestic consumption, uh, on uh, dom domestic services, uh, which again is a natural part and, and uh, a natural uh, rebalancing of the world economy. But as you say, if one part of the world economy rebalances, other parts of the world economy have to rebalance also. And so uh, moving away from a, a, an export engine towards a domestic engine for the European economy, you know, in part, you know, ECB monetary policy has helped us. Um, but there the, the maybe needs to be questioning, uh, I've mentioned already, maybe there's a role for fiscal. And more broadly, uh, the perennial debate about broader European policies is this, is the European policy set up in terms of innovation, uh, structural reform, um, uh, dynamism? Is it set up to deliver uh, the uh, environment in which the, the urban economy is going to perform well? So there's a large fraction of the world economy, the EU area and the EU essentially does need to have, a, I think, I agree, does need to have a, an internal assessment of um, you know, how we can develop the conditions to um, for, for the economy to grow, to grow well. Looks like the fiscal authorities uh, learned a lesson during the crisis and they'll come and open the spigots if we have a rerun of 2008. Uh, Mario Draghi's been quite forceful in his exit interviews saying it would be nice to have a little more expansionary fiscal policy soon before we get to the crisis. Do you think there's a reasonable prospect that looking across the Eurozone that fiscal policy will loosen in time to make 2020 or 2021 stronger than they'd otherwise be? So I, I think this is a, a nuanced debate, and this is why um, it's very important to think about that debate <coughs> in different ways. 
So first of all, it's, I think, very good news that the tail risk of a scenario where you have a big crisis, uh, if Anne was wondering, would the fiscal authorities be passive about that? The clear signal is no. They, they clearly have signaled that if there's a major crisis, they will step in. And uh, given that the fiscal balance sheets, of, you know, some of the major countries have improved quite a bit, that's credible. It's credible, having accumulated all of this fiscal space, that that kind of reserve uh, intervention power is there. Now the debate is also, uh, which is maybe something that maybe takes a while for that debate to, to fully develop, which is uh, historically for cyclical uh, downturns, you might say monetary policy can do the job. Um, because a fiscal authority might say, well, if I try and do a fiscal expansion, and I might get it wrong, because by the time I've done the expansion, maybe the economy's recovered. Uh, I might be, the multiplier might be negated because the central bank hikes rates because they see inflation. Uh, and so basically, uh, I think uh, now the accumulating evidence is where we are now is the inflationary pressures I'm not, I don't think they're zero, but they're sufficiently uh, moderate that I think uh, if there were fiscal expansion uh, in these current conditions, the multiplier would be quite big. And so then the question is, uh, this goes back to uh, finance ministers thinking about uh, fiscal policy as a macro tool. And you know, you might, for academics or you know, economists might say, well, okay, let's flip switch let's flip the switch and say, well, it's, we, we're now in that world. Uh, but given political systems, political cultures, uh, the, the process by which that analysis becomes normalized and sufficiently widespread, that it, it enters the uh, decision-making, fiscal decision-making. Now, in these weeks, budgets have been set for 2020. Uh, let's see how much of that uh, gets transmitted into decision-making, uh, and you know, let's see what happens next year. But I think uh, Mario Draghi and myself and the, the central banking world is basically saying, uh, look, uh, you need, if you're curious about our reaction function, our assessment is inflation is muted. Uh, with the forward guidance, you know the interest rates will only move if there's a persistent improvement in inflation. And so under those conditions, when you are trying to assess your fiscal position, uh, you can understand that the likelihood of fiscal multipliers being big uh, is, is significant. But again, all of that has been has to be nuanced, where that's a very conditional message. It's a message to those countries which are in good fiscal shape. It's not a message for taking fiscal risk uh, in those countries which are uh, you know, closer to, to the risk risk area. You talked a lot about the effects that you think monetary policy has had to date on growth and on inflation expectations that, that you're, you think the tools have made a difference. Are you confident that you have the tools to meet your inflation target in the medium term without some big changes in fiscal policy or something else? So let me emphasize, and we always try to be crystal clear about this, is our mandate is unconditional. It doesn't say in the treaty uh, only if fiscal policy right does its job, it's unconditional. So, uh, you know, our attitude is uh, we will, let me say two points. One is uh, we will continue to review both all of the instruments we do use and also instruments we haven't used to see what else uh, might, might be helpful. Uh, let me emphasize is we have a medium term perspective. So it's not the case uh, we feel that we, we need to kind of pull out every possible instrument um, in order to get inflation back towards two super quickly. We're prepared to be patient, but it's important that the momentum is there. It, it cannot be the case that we allow a, a lock-in of inflation expectations at too low a level. We have to demonstrate that even if in this world it takes longer than normal, we have to make sure the momentum is there. But, uh, you know, I think uh, we remain... Uh, our assessment is it remains the case, first of all, uh, that the, we have more policy options. But second, it's important to emphasize is we do see inflation momentum. We see it in the labor market. Uh, 
uh, we do see that, in fact, we've done so much eating. The historical pattern, which is built into our forecast, is that inflation is going to climb from where it is now towards, you know, the two-year head is 1.5. Uh, so we, we do think uh, a world where we achieve that is important. So wh where we are now is like what, one, one, one. Yeah, one, so, yeah. so one, going from 1 to 1 1.5 is, is a significant, I want to see that delivered. Mm -hmm. But if we, if we deliver that, then asking, well, moving from there closer towards the target. Uh, and, you know, by the way, that, that's the forecast before we made the policy move. So it's the, it's the forecast going into the meeting. I think the policy move itself will uh, accelerate and strengthen the inflation dynamic. And, uh, you know, the, the, the stat next staff forecast will be in December. So as you know, there's been a lot of attention to the uh, disagreements on the governing council. Mm. Everybody thought it was time to ease, but not everybody wanted to ease in the same way. Uh, uh, do you think there's a risk that that uh, very public difference of opinion shakes people's confidence that the ECB actually has the will to do whatever it takes to get inflation back? So I think, uh, again, it's a multi-level interpretation. One is, after 20 years of the euro, uh, maybe uh, there are positives to it. Maybe there's a positive to... So let's say that there was a disagreement, maybe historically in the past, but where essentially it was kept inside the governing council. It wasn't uh, as publicly rehearsed as this has been. Does that mean that this agreement didn't exist? Did that mean uh, that the kind of uh, solidity of future monetary policy was uh, uh, more secure? So, I'm not, so the one issue is disagreement. A second issue is open disagreement. And so I think that's an interesting issue about, um, I, I think, and in the end, you know, we, we uh, uh, I mean, obviously, I know the Fed is going through its review and its changes comms, but I think it's been very important that we have this pretty detailed statement after the after monetary policy meeting and, and then which is reinforced by the uh, press conference. And then when we publish the accounts a few weeks later, you can see the nature of the debate inside the ECB. So uh, when you get, come down to the core of it, uh, the most important message is there was general agreement we needed to act. Uh, when you have all of these unusual tools, uh, you know, I think it's natural that people have different views about the effectiveness of different instruments. Um, and we do have these very unusual uh, uh, conditions in, in the, Euro, in the in world economy. So I'm not overly bothered by the fact we, we've had this uh, high, high uh, public uh, um, discussion of, of the different instruments. But what's important, which I've tried to convey to you today, is this is not arbitrary. The decisions we made were based on very careful analysis uh, by, you know, which is really uh, a lot of work goes into making these calculations. Uh, and, you know, that's led by the ECB staff. Most of the, you know, expertise uh, in terms of what's going on is with the ECB staff. And, you know, I and the other members of the Governing Council have to take their work and study it. Uh, we remain responsible for po policy making the governing council. But when, uh, if you ask, well, could a different policy package, uh, what other policy package could have delivered the same amount of monetary stimulus? In a world where we already have negative interest rates, uh, you know, if we hadn't done the asset purchase program, um, then the logic of, uh, of it would have been maybe we would need to do more, say, on negative interest rates. Uh, and there's no easy choices here. Mm. So uh, I think there was a view in the U.S. not so long ago that, well, rates will be going up soon, and we don't, we'll, we'll avoid any kind of financial instability that's caused by very accommodative monetary policy and low uh, equilibrium rates of interest. Uh, now, of course, the Fed is easing. Uh, you've made clear that you're not going to tighten any time soon. You pointed out that uh, the ECB believes that negative interest rates have, have a very, haven't, haven't hurt, as some people predicted. But are you at all concerned that telling everybody that rates are going to be low for a long time, monetary policy is going to be accommodative, in some cases some of the post-crisis banking regulations are being rolled out, capital yeah. requirements are being diluted, that we're uh, r taking risks to financial stability now? So I think it's a very interesting question because – 
uh, on the one side, why are we eating? And also the market is telling us uh, is that there's a fair degree of pessimism about the future. So the, the, the classic conditions for financial instability when there's excessive optimism. So in the mid-2000s, people had, you know, this time is different, all sorts of constructed uh, fables about why it's okay to build a lot of houses and have hyper, uh, uh, hyper high loan to value ratios, all of that. So number one is, we're not particularly seeing it. Uh, obviously, there's going to be people taking more risk. Uh, we always signal that now the banks are pretty heavily supervised and regulated, but the non-bank sector, maybe there's more risk. And then you have to ask, who's taking that risk? And is that risk going to be a systemic problem? So we obviously spend a lot of time, and maybe compared to the US, more of the macroprudential framework's in place. You know, every, every month, uh, a lot of macroprudential policy in Europe is country by country. Every month, you see more and more countries putting in the safeguards, uh, whether it's counter-cyclical capital buffer, uh, whether it's uh, borrower-based measures for mortgages, uh, very innovative, like the, the uh, French macroprudential authority is this uh, 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 disincentive for lending to highly indebted corporates. A lot is going on to uh, ring fence those risks. But the core of it is, uh, if the question is, should you not do monetary stimulus for fear of financial stability risk, uh, I think that there's a pretty strong consensus in the economic literature is uh, that that's self-defeating. That you know, if you if you um, don't make sure inflation goes to target, if you don't make sure the economy is stable, uh, then it's pretty high price to pay for. Interest rates are too blunt a tool for financial stability management. Having said all that, we care. We do look at it. Uh, it's obvious that if we didn't care about finance, we could you know to be much more aggressive. So we do we do go incrementally. We do take moderate steps. Uh, to contain those risks. But the, the classic conditions for a lot of risk taking is not there. And by the way, we also know at this period in time, there's more, there is more indications of kind of a risk on attitude. So even the, the investor base is as not, not as gung ho as uh, in some periods of time. So I, I guess the definition of a good European central banker is someone who can find a silver lining in a gloomy and pessimistic outlook. I really admire that. Uh, we have time for some questions. I think I'm going to take a few and we'll do. Um, uh, do we have the mics? Can we start over here with, if you would, um, it help us if you would tell us who you are and stand up, John, can you stand up? Tell us who you are and uh, remember that to be fair to the rest of the people, it would be good if you asked a question. You can start, and then we'll go here. Yes, All please. Right. Great school, Jacina Capital. Um, thank you for the presentation. Very interesting. So I have a quick question on what set of conditions needs to be met for you to start raising interest rate to zero or above? And under the current circumstances, do you actually see an exit? Okay. In front of you, John. Jean Pizani, PIE. Um, the, the announcement at the last uh, meeting of the Governing Council that uh, you're going to resume uh, asset purchases has drawn the attention on the limitation uh, of this policy in terms of the portfolio of sovereign bonds you can buy. So the, the, the more you go, the more you're going to buy uh, um, bonds uh, issued by high debt countries. How do you see this limitation uh, in terms of the implication for, for the effectiveness of the policy? Right. Take one more. Uh, right over here. Hi, uh, Carl Gallant. Historically, under the Bretton Woods Agreement, the, the dollar was supposed to be redeemable internationally for gold. Of course, that um, was abandoned. Uh, is there any potential in the future for a geopolitically neutral kind of Bretton Woods where every country's uh, monetary unit would be redeemable in, in gold that would actually circulate as money to create stability for, for everyone. Thank you. Why don't you start with uh, John's question about are you pushing up against the limits of how much you can buy of any one country's bonds, and is that a constraint? So our assessment is that uh, this did not particularly come up in September because the calculation is uh, this is not an issue for an extended period of time. So within the current limits, uh, we think we can go for quite a long time uh, and, and buy and respect the, the principles we've always respected in terms of the 
the mix of what we buy. Uh, so, I mean, uh, and that's disagreed, you know, at some point. Uh, this goes back to the state contingent forward guidance. Uh, in the scenario we're in a situation uh, when this extended period of time concludes and we still have a problem, then, uh, then we have a, a kind of have to make a new calculation. And it's clear in the pursuit of our mandate uh, what we do has to be proportional to the challenge we face. If we're in a situation when we hit those limits and we're still below target, then we have to look at it. But there's no particular reason to take that on today. I mean, of course, everyone wants to do everything immediately, uh, but you know, I think it's, it's proportionate to say there's a value to these limits, there's a value at, to the current limits, it's, they, were, they were put in place for good reasons, and if we hit a conflict where the limits conflict with delivery of the inflation target, then we have to see what we well, do. Well, at the current pace of APP, are we talking years away from the limits or months or? Yeah, so I mean, uh, it all, for, for the, the implementation of the APP, uh, there's a lot of tactical decisions as we move along. So it, it's not, we don't, I mean, I'm not going to give you a fixed number because it, it depends, but it's, 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 uh, sufficiently far in the horizon mm -hmm. that it's not something we felt we needed to, to factor into the decision in September. And, I, I, you know, it's, it's well beyond a year at least. I don't want to go into uh, more detail than that. But people who say it's weeks or months, it's not true. Okay. Uh, I think you've stated pretty clearly what it'll take to raise rates. Uh, right. Sustained forecast of yeah. inflation at target. Plus, plus actual inflation being close enough. So it's a double lock. So we have to project. Because people say, well... Because it's interesting, you have historical periods when inflation jumps by a percentage point within a short period of time. Uh, but we're not going to, given that that's based on a history of where there's been lots of high inflation, uh, a forecast where we, where we say, well, actually, uh, hey, presto, uh, the, <laughs> there's going to be a big jump. Uh, we're not going to have that. So it, actual inflation has to be sufficiently close towards the projection that the, the, last, the last mile, if you like, is, is credible. I'm going to uh, change the gentleman's last question a bit. So one of the ways that monetary policy works is by moving exchange rates. Obviously, uh, the euro exchange rate will move more if other central banks are not easing at the same time. Do you have any concern that if we have this global easing, that your effectiveness, your policy will be limited by the, um, the, the inability to depreciate the euro? We don't overly focus on the exchange rate channel. So let me emphasize... I mean, it, it's hyper-visible in uh, 2014. So after the whatever it takes in 2012, there'd been a significant appreciation of the euro. So if you like, when you're in a situation in 2014 when actually you could say, actually, we think the euro's overvalued, the fact in 2014, early 2015, there was a big depreciation of the euro. So to some people say, well, that's... So QE worked through a big depreciation. But that was a very particular circumstance. Uh, in recent times, the euro has been basically flat. Uh, as we've already discussed, it's not the case we think uh, that the way for the European economy to recover is through kind of a, a massive uh, uh, drive in exporting. So, uh, I mean, we're focused on uh, the domestic uh, channels. It's not the exchange channel. So, I mean, I think the same I'm true, sure for any large central bank is the way the exchange rate matters is primarily in a situation of some kind of unexpected, large and persistent surge in the exchange rate. Then you may want to think about it. So when it moves away from fundamentals, uh, but it, it's, it's not, under these conditions, it's, it's not, so long as the exchange rate is more or less in a pretty broad zone of being connected to fundamentals, it's not the channel. Is for there general. any reason that we need a new Bretton Woods or a... So, so uh, let me come back. I mean, the other thing is, uh, monetary easing by us or by anyone else is good for the world economy. So I celebrate the fact more and more emerging markets are able to do monetary easing. So we see around the world, because uh, now they have more domestic currency financial systems, they're able to, to, when they have a slowdown, they're able to do easing. And the usual message is easing has positive spillovers. There might be a margin exchange rate channel, but by and large, there's positive spillovers. So easing everywhere is, is good for everyone. Uh, Peter Doyle here. Peter, can you stand up so the mic can find you? Uh, Peter Doyle, two questions, if I may. 
You mentioned that we should take confidence in the immediate outlook by the fact that one of the measures was the forecast would, that the, would be the inflation goes back to target. And then, uh, but I would point out that that condition has held ever since 2007 when consistently the ECB has been behind the curve. So then you emphasize the fact that you added a new condition, which is that the actual developments in inflation should also reflect some movement back to targets. My question is, what does that mean? Does that mean that some measure of inflation is no longer falling for some period of time? Does it mean that it's flat for some period of time? Does it mean that it's going up by a certain percentage? The risk being, obviously, that an interpretation of that, whichever you come to, may repeat the behind-the-curve problems that we have had in the past. My second question is about the, the, the high risks in the future and, and what happens with them. If I recall correctly from your charts, you say that the uh, um, unconventional measures have a combined effect so far of about two percentage points effect on long yields. So my question to you is how much is left? How much ammunition have you got left in the unconditional uh, ammunition stock to deal with any shocks that may come up? And the reason that's important is, is various, but one is that if there's not very much left, that adds to your point about the need for fiscal support. But if there is actually quite a lot left, then the fiscal authorities will say to you, you've got plenty left. Mm. We don't need to do anything. Thank you. Can you pass it to the right there? Bill Papadakis, Lombardo Dier. I have a somewhat related question. You showed how past easing measures have helped uh, the output and inflation outlook change. And anyone who looks at uh, credit growth turning from deeply negative to positive today can testify to that. But if today's source of risk is no longer a broken credit channel, but much more global conditions and uncertainty that depress demand for credit, then how exactly do you think about the effectiveness of these instruments in, in this very context? Thank you. some meaty questions there. Um, okay. You can pick and choose. Sure. Well, I'll try and get them. So the, the last one is, what's interesting, um, it's interesting how people think about the world is we have this manufacturing slowdown. And so, so I've heard this from various, well, how is market policy going to fix the manufacturing slowdown? Uh, I'm not saying it's going to fix the manufacturing slowdown, but um, other parts of the economy can, can uh, take up the baton. So, you know, it's the case that we still have a pretty strong services sector. Uh, we still have uh, households who are, their financial conditions are improving. So we do think, uh, you know, we're not picking and choosing about, well, which firms or which households are going to respond. And the, the kind of people who are looking to borrow today may be different to those who might have responded in different circumstances. Uh, so we, we, there's many challenges through which monetary policy works. So, and the importance of the, the different um, uh, channels uh, and, you know, the different geographies for that matter and different industries uh, will rotate. But as you say, credit is uh, in the... It's varying across countries, but in the aggregate, credit growth is pretty solid, you know. Uh, Peter's question on the uh, what's left, uh, uh, our assessment is uh, uh, we're, we're not at the edge, but of course we're closer to the edge than we were. So there's no doubt about that. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm, I don't have certainty about where the edge is. It's, very, it's going to be interesting. And this is why we are incremental. We're saying we're incremental. We're not. We're going to move in small steps because let's imagine we've gone from minus forty, you know, done a much bigger short rate cut. Uh, if I, we were, you know, we could have entertained that, but I think it's safer to go in smaller steps and then check and see uh, how effective that is. Uh, but I, I mean, I, I don't think. Um, uh, I mean, the, the fiscal debate is. I say it's a, it's a maturing debate where. The more people look at it, the more the outside world looks at it, the more we look at it, the more the people working in finance ministries look at it. Uh, you know, it's fairly striking that now that so much fiscal capital has been accumulated, after a lot of years of austerity, the, 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 the doubts about whether fiscal expansion can be counterproductive by raising risk premia for, you know, uh, important countries in Europe now, there can be no doubt. Uh, they would not see a rise in risk premium if there was a moderate fiscal expansion. Uh, 
uh, they can be confident there wouldn't be an offsetting rise in monetary policy rates. So, I mean, the accumulating evidence of the power of fiscal policy is pretty strong. Well, we don't get in, we're not getting into a game of, a games of, of, we have to be straightforward. We call it uh, as we see it. Uh, we're saying scientifically, we think fiscal multipliers would be quite big in this scenario, but it's not the case that we condition our policy on uh, what the fiscal... But you seem to be, uh, let me rephrase what you're saying. You don't want to say we can't deliver on our objective with our monetary policy tools. Uh, so that's not meddling with fiscal policy. If you really couldn't meet your objectives, you could say that. But you seem to be careful not to say that. What you seem to be saying is, look, we think we can meet our objective. There's a lot of uncertainty. We have a lot of ammo left. It would be easier to meet our, uh, our objective if we had some fiscal policy and it would make our job, our life better. Yeah, and it's important to say also the, uh, it's important to ground it, because you know, in grand narratives of, you know, if you take it to grand narrative, of course, monetary policy space is less than if interest rates are a lot higher. Of course it's true. Um, but it's also the case we've seen in recent years. I mean, go back to 2014. So the, the uh, fact that there was a fair degree of success in eliminating worse outcomes from 2014 uh, to now, I think provides a strong evidence base. It doesn't carry forward to the future one for one. But this is why we're heavily emphasizing the continuous assessment mm -hmm. uh, of what's going on now. And this is why it's so important to be data-driven and evidence-based. So the fact now we have a, a really, uh, our, and because we now have so much bank-level data, we can really go into, because someone has a, may have a narrative based on a certain type of bank. I say, okay, fine, but uh, the wide distribution of banks, that particular problem is not generally true in terms of uh, the transmission mechanism. So my assessment, David, is first of all, let me emphasize again, uh, although we can focus on the downward revisions and so on, that's a downward revision around a path that remains positive. And we are, a very important development in the last year and a half is the recovery in wage inflation. Uh, a big debate is um, how long can firms absorb that in lower profits. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, the history is they don't, they don't continually absorb them. They eventually, if the cost base is high enough, if they feel confident enough about demand conditions, they will raise prices. So, you know, our baseline, remember, our baseline is uh, inflation is, remains on an upward path. So this kind of uh, trap situation where we're kind of trapped or something uh, under today's conditions, I don't see it. Let's see what happens in the future. But it's important to say uh, we have momentum in the European economy. We have momentum in wage inflation. And uh, we, we, we think, and we've been quite, you know, uh, ECB has been quite creative in pushing the boundary of monetary policy. And we don't think uh, we're, we're, we're done yet if we, if we need to. Good. I think we're out of time. Uh, please join me in thanking Philip Lane. And I hope, I hope you'll come back sometime when we can get to more questions. It would be a fa would appreciate our staff would appreciate it if there are papers or coffee cups at your feet to put them in the trash can at the end. Get back to us.